Fuck. Good to see you all back from week one. Let's jump on in. All right, we'll get started. We'll start on time and get you um, out on time this week. So thank you all for being here for our second session of the Virtual Entrepreneurship Toolkit Series. For those of you that weren't here last week, um, my name's Cameron Law and I'm the Executive Director of the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I'm joined by one of our entrepreneurs in residence, uh, Dr. Brian Gladden. Uh, the Carlson Center serves as a regional hub and platform for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, community, and support to enable startup founders of all backgrounds to explore and launch their uh, businesses. Our mission is to make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region. And we have this clear vision to make the greater Sacramento region a premier hub for regional innovation and entrepreneurship. And we have a steadfast uh, core purpose to build the next generation of impact-driven innovators and entrepreneurs. And how we've gone about mobilizing that mission and vision is really to create a variety of programs that really support you along the entrepreneurial journey. And we've broken it into three main categories of discover, build, and launch. And our toolkit series is one of those build programs where we're providing you with the tools, the mindsets, and frameworks to go about systematically testing your idea and finding a way to find that right business model fit to help you get to market and be able to grow from there. Tonight's session, we're going to be focusing on the unique value proposition, solution, and your unfair advantage, which are three more of those core components of the Lean Canvas that we shared with you in week one. If you weren't here for week one, hopefully you're able to watch the recording and be able to plug in um, and hop in for this week two. Um, before I pass it over to Brian, want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'd love for you, if you are able to, to, to have your video on, if possible, it just makes for a greater experience to see all your faces. Um, and then during the presentation portion, if you're able to remain muted um, and less called upon during the breakouts and or if you have questions, um, we will be using the chat feature quite a bit for questions. Um, I'll be kind of looking through that. If you have questions to bring into Brian as he's presenting, um, feel free to, to put them in there. Uh, and a great exercise to start. I know we had a few people that were here last week, but if you wanted to reintroduce yourself, who you are, what you're working on and share your LinkedIn profile, would be a great way to connect with one, or, one another and start to build that entrepreneurial innovation community. So I'll now pass it back on over to, to Brian and thank you all for being here and excited to work with you in session two. Thank you, Cameron. Um, I was just uh, swiping at things. If you saw me crazy, I got a big mosquito in here. So hopefully it doesn't get me. There you go. Thanks for joining us. Looks like we got a great group tonight. Lots of repeat offenders, which we love. So thank you for the repeat offenders to coming back. So obviously means there's some value there versus a one and done. And to the newbies, we appreciate you joining and hopefully we add some value to you tonight here in week two and hopefully you join us for the rest of the series. Let me share my screen and we will start to get going. My apologies for uh, stepping in a little late there, guys. Oh, no, no worries. We're, we're off and running. We know people are grabbing their, their dinner and, and uh, hopping into it. So we're all good. All right, I think you guys can see my screen. Wonderful. Give me a second to get my annotation tool. Okay, so as Cameron said tonight, we're gonna continue on with the unique value prop solution and unfair advantage. And I know you've got some questions probably in the chat room, so if there's any burning ones, go ahead and ask those now before we jump into it. Cameron, did you see anything that we need to tackle before we jump in? Uh, it looks like there's just uh, some introductions going on, which is great. And um, if you are here as a student and you're signing up for the leadership initiative, I did put the form in there to check in so you get credit for that. Um, but yeah, let's just jump into the content. Okay. Feel free to use the chat and uh, for questions and we'll move on from there. Wonderful. So our goals this week for you, we hope you take away is that you understand your customer's job to be done. We'll talk more about this concept that you understand the road to get to problem solution fit. 
you understand how you can put yourself in your customer's shoes to better understand their problems, that you can create prototypes and test ideas, you can define your MVP and move toward product market fit. Interesting, as of yesterday, Bezos is no longer the CEO of Amazon. Uh, big news yesterday, but still a, a great quote that I try and put up most weeks, which is all about the customer, right? We'll keep our competitors focused on us while you stay focused on the customer, you're gonna be fine. And this is really what these first several weeks is about, is all about the customer's problems and you understanding them well enough to design a solution around it. If you weren't here last week, we talk a lot about the customer and the problem. And it's not about you as an entrepreneur creating a solution and then going to find a problem that it fits for. It's the other way around. You gotta find the problem, understand it well enough to then design the solution specifically for that. Otherwise, you're wasting time and resources. So we did the check marks last week, even early adopters and alternatives little bit and today is solution UVP and your unfair advantage. So UVP, getting to finding problem solution fit really is what we're looking for. And last week, if you remember, we talked about a step even before problem solution fit that many people don't talk about, which is customer problem fit. So before you even get to problem solution fit, you got to make sure that the problem that you think your customers have actually is their problem, the right customer segments. Then once you know that those problems actually exist in that customer segment, then we move to problem solution fit. Great, you have these problems. Does your idea of a solution actually fit their problems? And your offering really is your unique value proposition. So whatever that thing is you're creating, product, a software, an experience, you know, if you took a picture of that thing, put that on your lean canvas, that's your UVP. You don't have to list out 20 or 30 bullets of your value proposition and all the different things. That's really a layer underneath of the lean canvas. Just think of your UVP as that thing that you're selling to people, you're offering. The solution is really your top three features of your unique value prop that solve the problems of your customers. So when you're doing your canvas, think about what are those key features of something that you've built, whether it's technology or um, some sort of usability feature that are enabling you to solve the problems that aren't being met. That's what your solution really consists of. So at a high level, we wanted to talk again, a uh, slide that you've probably seen several times for those of you who've been here. Most of you are down here at the beginning and we kind of talk about this as the foundations as a mindset of an entrepreneur. We talked about last week and previously and then ideation. Your ideas in your head, you're talking to people about it, you're trying to document it. That's where the frameworks come into play, the Lean Canvas, the different tools, this series. Now you're trying to get to some early traction, trying to get to problem solution fit. You're still here in the learning cur curve. This whole problem solution fit really is done before you build this MVP, right? That's still a ways down the road because you don't have enough insights yet. So visually, this helps some of you on your journey of where am I at now? What am I building? Am I building the UVP, this thing first? And am I going to test it? And the answer is no. You don't build your MVP first. First, you got to figure out what the heck you want to build. And then hopefully we can get some traction and build the right thing. So just as a quick visual there, kind of helps some of you understand where you are and that you're, um, if you've already gotten to market and you have a MVP and a product and your revenue positive, wonderful, then hopefully we can potentially help you on scale and even uh, a little bit more around product market fit. So a concept that we've talked about before, and some of you might have heard, it's been around about 10, 12 years now, it's called jobs to be done. And jobs to be done basically is another way to say, what are my customers' problems? 
their pains, their wants, their needs, right? So some wants and needs are different, but if you encompass all those into the idea of there's a job to be done and that job could be a want or a need. And last week we talked about that a job could be social, emotional, or functional, right? I don't buy a Porsche because it's functional. I buy it because it's emotionally and socially fills a need. That's one of my jobs to get done if I'm buying a Porsche, fill that emotional and social need there. You know, I go golfing because it's not functional. It fills a job of being social or emotional, you know, spend time with your friends, get outside. So when we think about jobs to get done, it's really what are those most important things someone is buying a product or service from you for? What do they want to, you know, what are they hiring your product to do for them? To do that, there's a few tools that we can actually use to understand the customer's problems, their jobs, where they are in their journey. One of these tools is from Lean Stack, the people who have created Lean Canvas, so Ash Moria. And this really is our, we call it the Customer Forces Canvas. The Customer Forces Canvas is a way to help you visualize the customer's journey and where they are, what they use, why they might want to switch, and how you could potentially help them in your new solution. So if you think about it, in the customer's journey, you know, most of us are resistant to new ways, right? The friction, now I'm fine, do the old way. You know, you're comfortable here. Even if there's a little bit of pain, question is how much pain is there for you to switch of a product or service, right? That's the old way. Well, for most of us to switch and buy something new, there's a triggering event. Something has to happen. Either our expectations don't get met, there's some other macroeconomic thing like COVID that happens. You know, something happens where we say, ah, this is not good enough. I need a different, better way to do this. So somebody's expectations have been violated. At that point, the user here is either looking for something new, right? Motivated for some new outcome, or you're up here pulling them with the promise of a new offer. And hopefully it's both. And these would be an early adopter, somebody that has had an issue, looking for a new solution, has a significant pain. And this visual helps us kind of understand who these people might be, what could this triggering event be that you want to understand better, so you can go out and interview them and gather those insights. And up here at the end of the day, the desired outcome can be thought of as those jobs to get done. What are those jobs that are not getting done currently with the existing solutions in the market? Either not getting done at all or not getting done to their satisfaction, that there's enough pain that they wanna to switch to you for some reason. So for those of you who haven't seen the Customer Forces Canvas before, it's a great way to one, visualize, but two, be able to go and gather insights in the market, right? We wanna get out, talk to customers and non-customers, so when you're crafting an interview or something, we think about the experience. What's the customer going through? What's their journey now? And maybe ask questions around, you know, how did you used to do things? Why are you switching now? What is that pain that happened? And, you know, explain to me that pain. And then why are you looking for something new? What are those things that are not being met? Instead of, you know, saying, here's my solution, you know, would you like to buy it? Understanding their journey and where they're at. So let's look at an example of a job to be done. Actually, we have two of them. And some of you might have read this before. It's been in articles, Clayton Christensen, who kind of came up to, with this, um, a research. It was actually McDonald's. So McDonald's had said to uh, Clayton and his firm, people are buying milkshakes in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning. And they're always alone when they bought milkshakes. So it's always the drive through by themselves. And they wanted to understand why are people buying milkshakes at eight o'clock in the morning? So the assumptions were that those people just, you know, like milkshakes, maybe um, they had certain flavors that they liked, um, but really strange anomaly. 
So after talking to people who were buying the milkshakes, there was a much different job to get done than they expected. And the, the conventional perspective was because it was as good. What they found was because it kept people full until lunch or until they got to work where they could have a snack or you know some meal at work. So you're all in a hurry in the morning, you know, before COVID, we're all trying to rush to get to, to work, right? And so people would just quickly go through the drive through at McDonald's, get a milkshake if they didn't have their, you know, protein bar and protein drink with them, just to keep them filled up, which was shock to McDonald's. It wasn't because they were, you know, the best tasting milkshakes ever. It's just keep me filled up. I don't have time to stop right now and I don't have anything with me. So that really help them understand the customer's needs, why they were doing it. Then from that, they could then build, well, how do we make this even better? How can we help this job to get done even better? Is it different flavors? Is it different thicknesses? You know, what can we do to help this better? So when we think one thing, that's great, but that's your opinion. Let's verify what the job to be done is from the customers themselves. Here's another example, lift. So you need to get somewhere, but you can or don't want to drive yourself, right? That is your circumstance. Your motivation, you know, you want to have a ride come within several minutes. You want to be able to pay quickly, automatically, and you want to feel safe. So some of the jobs you want to get done are here, right? And your expected outcomes, pains, or potentially gains you want to avoid planning and scheduling ahead of time. You want to be able to skip money transactions with the driver. You want to be able to relax, right? More emotional, social, um, do email, read something, whatever. So understanding the job of a lift, it's not just get me to point A to point B. There are more jobs to get done. You want to be able to do several different things. And then these are the outcomes and your feelings, either pains or gains from those jobs. So if you think about, the highest priority three or four jobs for your solution. What are those jobs? And then what are the outcomes that the experience, the positive that they wanna get? And what could the negative potentially outcomes be if those things don't happen? So this is really a mindset, this job to be done. What is a tool we can use to actually quantify or visualize these jobs? We looked at the forces canvas about the customer's journey where you could use some interview techniques around. We look at jobs to be done with the mindset, understanding that we're hiring for a product to get a job done. So the tool that we like to use is called the Value Proposition Canvas. The Value Prop Canvas is created by Strategizer who created the business model canvas. This is where the Lean Canvas came from. So this is a, an amazing tool I love because again, it's customer centered. On the right-hand side, call this a customer profile. This is about the customer's job. What are those jobs they wanna get done? And if you did this as a workshop, we'd literally put some sticky notes here and you know, emotional, functional, social, what are those things they wanna get done? Then we'd look at if they get those jobs done, what are those gains that they hope to get from getting the job done, right? Get to work on time, feel full, right, whatever. What are the pains that could happen if they don't get the jobs done? Then you go to the left side of the canvas, which is you, the, the entrepreneur, the vendor. What are your products and services that you have to sell? And this is literally the things that are for sale that you have. You know, it could be the, 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 a device, you know, a warranty, you know, something that you're selling. From those things you have to sell your UVP, what are the features that create big gains? And what are the features that help relieve pains for customers? And when you draw lines and start to map those pain relievers and pains here and gain creators and gains over here, you start to see problem solution fit. Is your solution mapping to the customer's problems literally? And this is a great visual tool to help you understand, do you have the right jobs to be done? And are you focusing on the most important ones. And that's a key thing. You can prioritize and look at the most important ones from customer feedback. 
But look at a quick example. So this is Hilti, the power tool maker. Um, and you can see here their drill, that's their UVP, right? A drill. And here's their customer segment of construction, you know, worker. And their job is to get construction done, uh, making it simple here. They hope some positive gains are safe employees and work enjoyment. They hope that uh, some pains they're worried about is tools could be too expensive and time lost in maintaining a tool. So you know, over here, you have some features that you have of your tools that hopefully map to those. That helps you really understand and prioritize the customer's jobs. Just looking at your unique value prop in the customer segment. You really think of this as one layer underneath your lean canvas, right? Your lean canvas is your executive summary. And then, you know, all of the details about that UVP, about your customer needs and problems can get much more granular here with the value prop canvas. We want to focus on one value prop at a time. You might have several things, maybe a, a portfolio of products or services. You can do a value prop canvas for your product, one for a service, one for you know a warranty thing. If they're very different, you know, if it's just uh, um, one or two things, uh, you know, very simple, great. You can do one canvas, but just try and focus on one of one thing at a time. Emotional, social, functional jobs. Again, we looked at identify your highest value jobs first. You want to prioritize them. Once you get them done, then you can kind of rank them and focus on just a limited number of pain relievers and gain creators. You don't have to map all 20 things to the other 20. It could just be the most important. And that's, that's the goal. When you do that, this is you know, really what it looks like. Literally, we say these things are mapping to the most important and these are here, now we have fit. And that's what customer discovery, where we're at now in that learning insights phase is all about. You've got to get that feedback from your current customers, your non-customers, just to understand their needs better. We'll do one more example and then we'll do an exercise. So Tesla, if we look at this, first of all, who is their target market? Their target market is upper middle class males that make over $100,000. So knowing that, they said, okay, what, is the, what are the jobs to be done from those upper class males? Well, they wanna be different from others. That was a job, wanna be unique, right? Some more emotional there. They want to go on long distance trips, not just to point A to point B, want to commute to work, simple personal mobility, very functional, but a convey an image of success, so very social there. What are some gains that these people hope to get uh, from getting those things done? Well, uh, if they were being able to, they'd like to have you know up to, up to seven seats, high safety ratings, a high end battery, long range for long trips, act like a premium sports car, want it to be brand recognized so they feel good, compliments from friends, and they want a cool design. So the pains worrying about an electric vehicle, they're worried about accidents because it's, it has to have a long life of being tested and, and accidents, frequent charging, fear of the battery being dead, you know, lack of charging stations if they are on the road, and because something's new, obviously things always, as they scale up, economies of scale, price goes down, they're worried about the price dropping after they buy it. So over here on the right hand, left hand side, Tesla, you know, literally has two models, right? Model X, Model 3, and when they started, uh, and I'm sorry, the Model S. So they also have a extended battery warranty, right? That's something you can actually buy. Plus you could buy a few options, right? Things on the car themselves that might be extras. Some gain creators, so you've got a 17 inch touchscreen. So that's a literal feature of that car you bought, which could help map to one of these other things, right? Could act, you know, uh, compliments, uh, design, you know, um, technology, autonomous car driver, that's a feature of it. So again, could be something here that's uh, you know, helping with either safety or you know, compliments. 
design and style, right, to brand recognition and design, and that it goes zero to 100 kilometers in under six seconds. So acting like a sports car. So these features of the car map pretty good to many of these gains that they're hoping for. Down here, and sometimes you have to play with it. Do I put it as a gain creator or pain reliever? You don't want to put them both. But um, charging network. So that charging network is great. So it's going to eliminate a lot of these pains over here, whether it's frequent charging, lack of stations, fear of a dead battery. Having that network will relieve those pains, as well as being able to have up to seven seats, but then um, you know, charging going a long, a long way. So those two things are probably the main things here they're going to map to some of these fears of the dead battery so if you have that and you've got several of these which you think are the most important then you've got fit you don't have to map to all of them so let's do an exercise to kind of get some hands-on experience with using the value prop canvas understanding potentially how to map and list some uh, jobs and pains and games we're going to use DoorDash as an example. And what we're going to do is we're all going to break into two different breakout rooms. And Cameron and I will be in those rooms. And we're going to basically use a Google Doc. And we'll, as teams, have you guys tell us, you know, what are some jobs to be done uh, if you were going to use a company like DoorDash? You know, what, what is the purpose? And then what are some gains or pains that you might be worried about as a customer? So I want to, um, before we head out to breakout rooms, I wanted to see if there was any questions. And then one, if you just go back a slide, I wanted to make a quick comment as we look at gains and pains. Um, as we tie that to kind of the customer's forces canvas that Brian spoke to, think of those pains as the inertia that would be fighting a consumer's decision not to, to buy the product, right? So in the case of Tesla was, you know, I don't know if there's enough charging stations and things like that. Those are what a customer might be telling his or herself of making that decision and really fighting that. Whereas the gains are what are those push and those pull factors of them ultimately going up that hill to, to buy your offering. Um, so it looks like we have a question from Jay. Um, VPC, uh, so value proposition canvas should happen after MVP or before it? Oh, good question. Way, way before. So your MVP were, is not even in discussion yet. So you're still trying to figure out what the customer needs uh, and wants. So you can gather those insights to create first an offer. We don't even ever build anything until we actually create an offer back to somebody. So it's opposite of what most people are doing. Instead of building something and then demoing it and then selling it, the new theory is you're going to actually demo vapor sell that idea to somebody and then you're going to build it once somebody says yeah that's what i want and this is the new entrepreneurial kind of journey and, and lean stack and lean canvas teachings so you don't waste time and money so this is way before great great question jay any other questions before we head to the breakout rooms brian i chatted the link to you just so you know thank you going once Going twice. All right, we're going to head into um, breakout rooms. We're going to have uh, 15 minutes, Brian. 15 minutes, you got it. All right, we'll have 15 minutes and we'll go through a value prop canvas and we'll go from there. All right, you'll see, uh, some of you might not see something, you'll be staying in this room with me. All righty. So I'm going to share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. All righty. All righty. We're rocking and rolling here. So does anyone have any questions about DoorDash? Does everyone know what DoorDash is? Or do we need to do a quick 10 second what it is? If you don't know, no worries. That's totally fine. All right. Well, we'll jump on in. So. Uh, starting us off, are, we're going to start in this jobs to be done area of um, the DoorDash experience. And so the first question, what's the first question we need to ask ourselves as we look at this um, customer segment? And it's unique to uh, DoorDash and other platforms. 
Deliver food to your house so you don't have to go get it. Okay, um, so that's a that's one of the jobs for sure. So the the first question we need to think about is: Are we targeting the customer segment, being the restaurants, or are we targeting the users, the people that are ordering foods? So who do we want to design this value proposition canvas for? Wouldn't it be both? So we we could do both, but that's gonna when you're typically building it out, the offering to a business will be very different in terms of the pains and gains than it would be for an individual user. So you are correct in the overall scheme of building out your value proposition canvas, you would do both, but um, you would create different ones for each of those different segments. Okay. Great, great point though. Um, so as a group, we would uh, decide kind of who we want to focus on if we want to do the users that you know would be ordering the food or if we wanted to do the restaurants. I would say ordering the food. All right, we're gonna do the, the user side. So what are the jobs to be done of that user side? Uh, transportation of the food. All right. Feel free to unmute yourself and throw out ideas. And remember our jobs to be done are social, emotional, and the functional jobs. Is variety a job? <laughs> Giving people choice? Yep, so providing um, choice of food vendors. Uh, safely processing my payment. Yep. Processing. Yeah. If you're busy, you could be able to have an or order food uh, and not worry about um, cooking, I guess. So expediency. Um, in order you can also you can, can can don't you have the option now to order a, like a head so you can do like weekly deliveries i think for or some something yeah like so like meal planning yeah you can okay. schedule yeah. it out meal planning yeah nice. that's, thank you yeah that's the that's what i was looking for meal planning teamwork makes a dream work <laughs> sir <laughs> think along with meal planning accessibility Okay. Mm, nice. Nice. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that as a little doodad. I don't know if that's the right word, but a little doodad to that one. Um, anything else? So as you think of kind of that, we're putting ourselves in the, the shoes of that user. Um, what are some of just those core jobs that we have? Obviously that they want to get food, you know, the process, the payment safely and easily, um, you know, planning some of the food. Is there, if those are achieved, what are some of the, um, I guess, what are we trying to achieve sometimes by having the expediency? What is that allowing us to do? Is that like spending time with family, um, eating safely in a COVID world? What are some of those types of jobs that we're trying to have filled? Yeah, I think not 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 being, getting out in the public and just having food at the resort make it, uh, safe and easy for people. Okay. All right. So Any other I have a, Go ahead. I Go guess ahead. my question is, is that a job or are, does that move us into pains and gains? It's a good question. Um, so in terms of the, the safe access to, to food, that's probably on the border of one of those pains and gains, I would agree. Um, and even safely. I think when we start using those uh, adjectives around safe and, and those types of things, that's when we're looking at the, the pains and gains because there's some level of value generation um, versus being able to just process a, a payment is just a functional need of the, the app, right? Um, versus, you know, I might have a, a pain that they might steal my credit card information, right? So I would use a DoorDash maybe over some restaurant that would just be taking my number over the phone or something like that. Um, so do we think this would be a gain or a pain? Well, I, th I think it's all of the above. I think it's a job to be done. It's a gain when you bring it to me safe and it's a pain if you don't bring it to me safe. Okay. Uh, Sorry, but but we're going to throw it right in there. <laughs> what wouldn't the gain be how they do it? So if I want safe food, the gain, um, like, 
isn't it more about maybe how that's done? So the how is typically on the other side, right? So that's how the, those are the gain creators and the pain relievers. Um, mm -hmm. The gains are um, kind of the, yeah, the next level thinking of what that, um, you know, processing, providing a choice of food. So is that, you know, um, a pain might be limited uh, option or um, lim maybe a pain is, a limited menu because it's online or something like that. So that's a, a pain that they might need to overcome. Um, so that's just the most functional component, but then there's like that next level strata of um, thinking, right? So in terms of expediency and ordering process, maybe a gain is having clarity of actually seeing where we are in the process, right? Um, did the order go through? Did the uh, delivery person pick it up? Um, those are kind of that next level component. So let's, let's move to the, to the gains portion and kind of throw some things out there. You could free time up to do other things. Like you said, spend time with your family. Yeah. Yeah. What about not, not having to get dressed to drive somewhere? <laughs> spend time. Uh, so not having an address? No, not, you could, you can go to the door with your pajamas on without having to get dressed up to go to the Definitely. store all right yeah um, which 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 incidentally um affects how much how much how, how, how many times people are washing clothes per day which actually reduces water i mean this is this is like like cameron was saying next level thinking but it just makes sense in a hundred years in the comfort of your pjs I like it. I didn't spell comfort right, but that's all right. That shows my higher education there. You don't have to grocery shop. Um, don't need to grocery shop. All right. Um, limited grocery shopping. The grocery shopping. So is that like more more time back? and stress. You're not limited by restaurant location. Like if you go to a restaurant and it's not the one you want, I mean, all of a sudden you are now limited to where you can go. Whereas if on this, you get all of them. So you're saying um, increases access to new, new venues? Sure. New restaurants. Um. Diet friendly. So, for example, if you're vegan or if you want certain vegetarian dishes or just a variety of food accessible, I think makes it attractive to a lot of people. So, do you think? Um, so, is that a? Do you think the um, that's a gain, or would that be a hesitation for people using if they're on like a strict diet? Is that something that might limit their usage? I, I'm not. From, I'm not sure if. Uh, DoorDash does do like you can type in vegan or not, and it gives you those options. Um, if it is, then maybe that is a, you know, targeted list of. Um, I believe you. Diet friendly or something. Positive. Let's check. Let's check there. <laughs> I have my DoorDash on I the way right now. <laughs> I think you can. Um, target targeted. Um, yeah, you can by convenience. Um, fast food, desserts, chicken. Your diet. Um, it's under healthy Cameron. There we go. <laughs> uh, obviously I haven't used the healthy one. Alma. <laughs> you can also support local businesses. Nice. I like that. Um, okay. For local biz. Um, all right, let's move to some of the pains. What would be, what would be an inertia fighting us from using DoorDash versus um, going to a restaurant or, you know, just calling in ourselves. Um, have some, so so have some weird person come over to your house. Uh, could freak some people out. Random person. Maybe cold food. You know, you don't get hot food sometimes yeah. because of like how many they're delivering at a point. Not being nice. warm or not being what you actually ordered. That's it. 
Exactly, Chris, exactly. Good. Keep them coming, keep them coming. I Maybe too them. many options. Too many, I like that, too many options. Uh, yeah, there's all this okay, like paralyzed that. by decision. What about not bringing the right condiments that you asked for? <laughs> Wrong. All right, we'll add that to the um, wrong delivered order. So um, mix up. You know, when I, I know. don't get those napkins, you know, that's 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 something. <laughs> the the napkins. That's a, a cute. I mean, you you end up with a ton of um, basically waste with the the takeout containers. Yep. It's a great one. And delivery fees. So the, the cost might be. Right, high cost for delivery. Okay. High cost for the restaurant. So um, impact on restaurant. Timing of delivery, I guess. So, like, not knowing when it, um, like, timing of it. Okay. Timing of. When they started delivering multiple at a time, I think it delays some of the orders. Right. We got it. We, we have a lot of pains. We, we're feeling the, the pain, which is, this is good. Um, say that again. I think that was you, Carrie. Yeah, I think they started allowing them to deliver multiple orders at the same time, which means that some sit longer. Yep, I did. I did actually have that recently. Yeah. Deliveries. What about food, food safety around the not being warm, but like not being... Um, handled well while it's waiting. Prep of food. Awesome. All right. So we have about a minute and 20 seconds. Are we good on the, on the, the pains there? How do we feel? Um, so as we're kind of looking at this, one of the things, you know, where we're really pulling this value proposition canvas is these are, these are key terms that we would be using and talking about our offering to our customer segment, right? So in the case of, you know, that customer forces canvas, right? These are at the top of the hill, you're saying, hey, we're gonna help you um, get an opportunity to have a, your choice of food vendors. We're gonna safely process your payment in the right way. We'll help you hit your meal planning goals and we transport the food to you, right? And then the next level thinking was that will allow you also to spend time with your family, grab food in the comfort of your PJs. You don't even have to go to the grocery store. We're gonna deliver it to you. And I know you have some of these concerns, right? So these are, that's the inertia fighting you, right? So, you know, we know there's gonna be a random person that's dropping it off, but these are our DoorDash deliverers. We have a process to go through, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we look at our handle and food prep very we make sure people wear masks or whatever. Um, and so then you can start to address some of those main pains that your customer segment is feeling. Um, so are there any questions um, related to kind of the, the role this plays and in, in the exercise that we had before I bring back the other group? Uh, hey, Cameron. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I've worked with some folks recently and um, one of the things that they did what they didn't do was to go through this exercise. And once you go through this, you really get much more clarity on the problem, who the actual customer is, and you've got to do that all before you do your MVP. And uh, it just came through loud and clear in the situations I was working with. So for anybody that's new here, uh, start with the customer before you go to the solution. Definitely. And this will help you um, as you're going through customer development calls, right? So you're interviewing customers, right? You'll learn about, hey, how do you currently order food? Or how, you know, what are some current pains with the existing uh, solutions, right? And you start to gain 
more information in this space so you can build the proper solution, whether that be a product or service for them. So I'm going to call them back. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, they'll have about a minute hopping back. Um, I'm happy to answer it um, while we wait. Anything from Brian's part earlier around jobs to be done or just the value prop canvas in general? Is anyone gonna order DoorDash tonight? We should, we should get like, we should get sponsored by them. I feel like we've done this so many times with them. Um, Kelly, I see you nodding, let's, let's work on it, so. Five dollar gift card, something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. I like that. All right, Dick ordered some Moss Taco. There we go. I like it. All right, they'll be back in a matter of seconds. All right, they should all be zooming back in here. All right, welcome back, Brian and Breakout Room. Hey. How'd we do? I think we did pretty good. They didn't fail. I think my, my team, they did all right. Hey, we were Brian, having a good time. Doing? There you go. Did we got, we got one order on DoorDash already, so how about you, Brian? <laughs> uh, no, but if you can send it to my home, that would be good because I haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> uh, something, you know, nice and lean. There we go. Cool. All right. Good stuff. So any, any questions, comments on that, that I think was usually is, is one of the, I think more fun, popular exercises because you really can quickly understand how to list things and it's a little bit of an art, but also, you know, there's some science. So you don't want to, something that could be a gain, you could, the way you word it could be a pain, right? Or vice versa. And the norm is when you start quickly ideating and just throwing out all these things, we normally, everybody wants to put them under jobs to get done, right? It's like, well, this, this job, this job, this job. And if you really start to look at them, you'll say, oh, that's probably more of a gain that I want to have happen, right? Or a pain that I'm worried about, not so much as a job. And so that's very normal. And the more you do that, um, you know, even let it sit for a day, you go back and you go, you know what, that's more of a gain or that's more of a pain and kind of get down to maybe five, six, seven real jobs to get done but you might have 20 pains and gains, right? It's between emotional and social. So um, just great practice. Any, anyone have any insights they thought from that? I, I have one. I thought it was great to do it as a group. Um, to have that, I mean, look, none of the people who were in my group have I ever spoken with before, right? But, uh, but there was good synergy. There was really good input. There were good comments back and forth. Um, great energy in, in, uh, in coming up with ideas and kind of narrowing things down. Good, good, that's great. Yeah, I, I thought it was wonderful. And a cohort in general, when you do breakout rooms, you know, you get some different unique perspectives, which is the key, right? So we all have our lens and you kind of get different, uh, different pains, gains, and jobs. So it's really good to, to do that with your teams. All yeah. right, well. Can I expand on that? Just one more thing, <laughs> sorry. Um, it also kind of helped to be able to further define a pain and a gain and a job, right? Because uh, you might throw, some people would throw, or I would throw something out that would be a gain, but someone else could comment that that could also be a pain that would lead to a job you know, so uh, yeah, that that was helpful as well. Oh, I have, I have questions. Uh, I think I've posted on the on the board already. Um, Go for it. Okay, so it looks like Domino Pizza has been around for like tens of years, maybe twenty or thirty years, even or older. Why they didn't catch on for the DoorDash fancy? I would say, if we're putting DoorDash as an example. Another example would be the vaccines, okay? But, but let's talk about DoorDash first, uh, or Domino first, Domino Pizza. Those delivery services has been around for years. Why didn't, why didn't they take off? Great question. 
so I, yeah, well, my thought goes to, and I think you'll appreciate it is, uh, so in, in week next week, we'll cover blue ocean strategy. And I think partly where, um, Domino's thinking, right. They what had what we would call a red ocean strategy. They were competing in the pizza market and with their, uh, you know, other kind of fast food. Right. And they weren't necessarily thinking about the delivery service as one of their core offerings. Right. And so they didn't see that as the creating value aspect. Um, so they're missing the forest per se. Yeah. I, but Domino's yeah. stock quadrupled over the last four or five years. So they've mm -hmm. actually done a very good job in their space for what it's worth. Yeah, no, uh, definitely Domino's is, is uh, doing great in terms of them not, you know, obviously creating the app of, of DoorDash. Um, you know, I think that was partly, you know, some of the thought they're by no means a non-existent player, like a, a, a quote Kodak story or something. So do you think um, uh, democratized or not democratized? I would say um, widely use of um, contractor, 1099 based contractor. Would that give a, a total difference? Because it looks like Domino Pizza hire everyone as their employee or part-time employee. But DoorDash is using a model as uh, the same as Uber, as a purely contractor. And they- so, Yeah, there's pros and cons, right? So it depends yeah. on what their UVP and who their market was. So to your point, Domino was just focused on their pizza market beating out that industry direct competitors and one of their they think benefits is to have that consistent experience of their driver uniform you know um very um consistent right like mcdonald's you know dominoes you're going to get it the guy's going to be in the uniform get the car so that's some of their unique value prop but they weren't looking at how do we take that piece of our business and do it for every type of industry, right? Like DoorDash is more of a horizontal. Yeah. So that, very different value prop, different market segment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just happens to be a delivering of something, but not not to the same people for the same reasons. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, okay. Get back here. All right. Got it. Okay, so if you uh, are someone who wants uh, you know, actions and activities, uh, homework, this would be your first thing, right? For, t for this week, create your value prop canvas. If you are someone who's in the journey already, you've got an idea, you've got your business model, this would be the next logical step is what, who are my potential customers? What are their jobs, pains and gains? And really trying to understand them better. And you can even use those other tools to help you uncover this, right? The customer forces canvas and just that, that mindset. So now let's pretend you've gotten problem solution fit, you're going, um, got some traction. How do we get to product market fit, right? That's next. And then creating this MVP and prototyping as someone asked about. So after we understand the problems in the customers, we start to actually potentially craft an offer what an offer could look like, which is vaporware, you know, these features, this price um, to this customer. To get to product market fit, we really need to do a lot of prototyping and potentially some brainstorming to get to that MVP. And remember MVP, your minimum viable product is meant to sell to early adopters. It's not meant to sell to the entire market. That's why it's minimum viable. The only people that are gonna buy a minimum viable product are the early adopters who have that really significant pain point. If you're selling it to the entire market, then you over-engineered your MVP. It's technically not an MVP. It's a full product, which you don't need to do to start getting revenue and traction. You just need to start selling it to your early adopters so that you can show traction, start to get revenue, and then hopefully get to product market fit by adding more things that the general public wants. So down here, how do we get the MVP? We've done your business model. We've looked at the problem and gathered insights. 
And now we're trying to des design and craft a solution to make an offer to a potential customer. And this is that we call it a mafia offer. It's so good they can't refuse it is the idea. Potentially signing up for you know, a pre-sign up. So yeah, when you build it, I'll buy it. Maybe a letter of intent, just maybe a waiting list. And that's really where the rubber hits the road because now you've gotten enough stuff to have something to build. Doesn't mean you've built it. And maybe you probably refined your business model from all these insights from what you currently started with. Once we have enough info from our offer, people saying, yes, I would buy that or price is too high or this is not right. You have to keep reiterating till you get some traction here. That's when you build the MVP to sell the MVP. So when we look at lean startup, so most of you have heard lean startup, you probably read the book and everything. It's really just a methodology and a mindset, which is build, measure, learn, it's right? They're trying to build something, measure those things to the customer and learn from it. And this is why it fits perfectly with all of these tools and other processes framework we're talking about because it's really just that mindset of you know, quickly understanding and learning from stuff. We have a hypothesis, we're identifying our assumptions, whether it's a something that we think the customer wants or has a problem with. We're identifying our biggest risks first. We then build a, a, a plan, right, to test that experiment, whether it's an interview or a prototype. So a prototype, you've built something here, maybe it's a landing page, and now we're measuring did people go there? Were they interested? Did they download my app? Whatever it might be, join my mailing list. And now we're, we're testing that assumption. That, that's our measurements here. From that, we're going to learn. We're gonna look at the feedback. Oop, got my, my uh, mosquito there. Um, we're going to hopefully be able to take those learnings, whether they're unvalidated or validated, and go to the next step. If it's unvalidated, right, we have to go back and do it again. Hopefully, you know, two week lean sprint, we call them. In two weeks, you just wanna get it out there, get feedback, learn from it, do it again. That's why this agile methodology of being lean is much different than the old way of building something, taking months to build it, go out in the market, test it. By the time you get back around, it's, you know, three to six months later, which is much too long and it's very static and costly. So how do we use that lean startup mentality with lean stack? Well, very, very inclusive. You know, this is why lean stack is um, using a lot of these methods together. We have our discovery, which is what you're doing. Um, we have evidence. We're looking for problems and constraints. We're trying to gather insights, which is the whole learning and measuring. We, for measuring, we have a hypothesis and we experiment, right? We're trying to get some traction. So this is just the visual from Lean Stack, which is very similar to Lean Startup. So if you're wondering how they two go together, it's basically in sync. And now we're trying to gather enough insights to create something to, to build an MVP. Normal question is, gee, how do I know when I'm done with an experiment? Did, it, did I learn enough? Well, if you've done one or two experiments and the learning comes back pretty much the same all the time, you haven't learned anything new, then you're done with that learning. You're done with that experiment, right? Um, either you need to persevere, you validated stuff, or you need to pivot that you know, you're, you don't have enough information that it's just not working, or you've gotten stuff that says, no, no one has this problem, and we're gonna pause, right? Kind of three Ps. And it needs to be time box. So when we talk about sprints, innovation sprint, lean sprint, it's usually two weeks. And it's quick. You want to get a hypothesis. You want to test something, get it out there and learn quickly because otherwise you'll be testing forever and ever and you'll never be done testing and you'll never build anything and you'll never get to the market. So it's got to be fast, got to be quick. Um, and this is to me the hardest piece of getting any business to, to market, even a current one where they're trying to get new products. People don't want to do the discovery and the testing, because it's hard. I touched on this already, 
But what is a minimum viable product? Well, minimum, the most rudimentary bare bones foundation of the solution possible. Viable, sufficient enough for early adopters. Product, something tangible they can, you know, basically feel or, or purchase. So as you, especially for you people who are here who are technologists, techie folks usually have a predisposition to want to build stuff first or overbuild things and over-engineer things, which is why many Silicon Valley startups fail. One, because they build the product first and actually nobody cares, nobody wants the product. They try and build something and then go find a problem for it. That doesn't work. Or they over-engineer it so much that early adopters, they might you know, buy it, but now the price is so high because you've over-engineered it that you know, maybe the market's not gonna accept it. So, or you spend so much time that your costs are really, really, really high. So you just wanna get traction with a minimum set of features that someone's actually gonna pay you for. So what can this look like? Um, the left-hand side is no, and the right-hand side is a yes, right? So when we think about building our MVP, it's not just the bare bones of the functional pieces of your product or service, but it has to be a minimum set of everything that's filling that early adopter's needs, right? Their jobs to get done. And that could be emotional or social. So a lot of times we think of this is just the minimum functional thing that doesn't work, right? There's not enough value for the early adopter. They're the one with the big pain. They're wanting a solution, but they don't want just the functional. They want the, at least a minimum emotional social jobs as well, right? Is it reliable? And I use it, you know, delightful, right? So that's more emotional and social, right? Versus just, yeah, I, I have these three features that it does something. So over here, you're just getting them a very minimal slice of what's possible enough that there's enough value that they would purchase that. Does that make sense? Any questions there, MVP? If there's any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or unmute yourself and we can bring that on in to um, Brian or myself. All right. Go in once. So, so go ahead. I was just gonna say, uh, Yama had thrown a, a graphic in the chat. So if you wanted to check that, that was actually a um, great graphic to look at kind of the intersection of what an MVP is as well. So um, if there's no questions, we'll keep moving along. So now um, we've, we're looking to design this MVP. How do we actually physically design our MVP? Um, again, a few leading methodologies, mindsets we can use in conjunction with all the other tools we're using. They go together because all these things we're talking about, tools, process, frameworks, are all customers at the center of everything. So design thinking, many of you probably heard that, or human-centered design, same thing. It's really just a mindset. It's designing your product or service with the customer in mind, right? How is the customer going to physically hold this or use this um, or the service. It's putting yourself in their shoes. So empathy, trying to walk in their shoes. And it's about exploring ideas. This is where brainstorming comes from, is around design thinking, ideation. And it's all about doing it quickly and learning, which is again, perfectly in sync with Lean Startup, right? Build, measure, learn really quick. And here, as you can see, we're understanding we're exploring ideas and we're materializing. Well, we're, we're empathizing, we're ideating, and we're building a prototype and we're testing it. So it's very similar to build, measure, learn for lean startup. Again, very quick and agile. Why should you care? Because those firms that really design their product and service with the customer in mind have a significantly high, bigger financial advantage over their competitors. The Design Management Institute, a firm that obviously tracks design thinking companies, did a 10-year study from 05 to 2015. And all they looked at was the S&P 500. And they looked at the 
firms that say they're design thinking firms, and there's a checklist of criteria, like a dozen things you have to do to be a design thinking firm and you get certified as a design thinking firm. So not everybody is. And if you look at those names down here, you won't be surprised. Apple, Coke, Ford, um, Starbucks, Disney, Target, right? All the awesome customer experience companies, when we think of them, we have good thoughts usually about a good customer experience. And this is not by accident because they are design thinking firms that everything they do, <clears throat> every product or service is all about the customer and how they're using it. So they looked at those 16 companies versus the rest of the S&P 500 over 10 years. And that was the only variable. And those 16 firms had a 211% higher return on investment than the rest of the S&P 500. So people get it and buy your stuff when you're designing with them in mind. So what are some other tools we can use in design thinking to help us design to get to the MVP, design prototypes to get feedback from our customers to make sure we're designing it right? Well, I'm sure everyone here has done brainstorming at some level, right? Most of us have probably done it incorrectly. I know I did until a couple of years ago. Um, most of us sit around the room and you say, hey, all right, here's our topic. Let's brainstorm some ideas. And you throw out an idea and then other people start vetting that idea and shooting it down or saying, yes, that's incorrect. So proper way to do design thinking or ideation to come up with new innovative ideas, the first, section is really the diver divergent section, which is, this is the area, the fun area where we're capturing all these crazy innovative ideas. You, know, you have your topic um, and the idea, you've probably seen whiteboards where you have our, our rooms, yellow stickies or pink stickies everywhere. That's the accurate way to go about it. You're gonna list an idea on a piece of paper, sticky note, right? And you're gonna put it on the board and everyone's doing that with basically no talking, no vetting, no interruptions, um, and no, you know, the usual A-type person who takes over the conversation or the boss who takes over the conversation and people are afraid to speak up. So this is the proper way to diverge and get a whole bunch of ideas that you might not otherwise get. And the goal here is to be as crazy as possible in your divergent thinking. When you do brainstorming and ideation here on the divergent phase, the ideas don't even have to be feasible. Like, okay, I want to, you know, I'm uh, doing a, a zoo project and I want to increase people to the zoo and I'm targeting um, the grandparents or people without kids. All right. And you're like, all right, I'm going to uh, bring a, a tiger into the, you know, kids kindergarten room. Okay. Well, yeah. Very creative and, and crazy, probably can't happen for safety reasons. Doesn't mean you can't list it down. Maybe there's a reason, something you can do a little bit less, uh, you know, uh, with uh, safety in mind. Once you do that, then you start to do the emergent section, which is now you examine the ideas that have been up there. People actually go around, read all of them and vote on them, little star or check mark, whatever. After you do all that, now you've been able to get your opinion heard without the A-type or your boss saying, no, that idea sucks or it won't work. You've all now voted. Then you cluster all the ideas into themes and you'll be shocked that you could have 500 ideas on a board and it'll probably come down to about seven to 10 different themes of some sort that are emerging. Once you do that, then you start to discuss all of those ideas in the themes. And you probably will have several that have many check marks or stars or smiley faces that will emerge, which will probably end up being one or two of the same ideas. And now you can discuss those and decide, gee, in this uh, um, cluster or theme, is this a great idea? Do we move forward with this? And so now you've heard everyone's idea, you've discussed, you've voted, and now you can converge all these crazy ideas into a few ideas to move forward with. 
So if you're going to do brainstorming, I recommend doing it the proper way. Um, you know, again, defer judgment, encourage wild ideas, build on ideas of others. You have a time, <clears throat> time bound, you know, stay focused when you're vetting one conversation at a time. And you could even be visual and sketch. So it's all about getting quantity, not quality, which is unusual, right? When we talk of business. It's about as many crazy ideas as you can. It's not about coming up with the right idea in the beginning. When we do that, now we're in the ideation phase, trying to understand how we could solve the problem that we've already confirmed in the problem solution fit stage. So here's how we're getting to MVP to design and create your offer is we're kind of ideating the solution, right? What could this look like? So building that MVP, now you've got a prototype. We ideated right here. Now we've got a prototype. We literally have to build something that represents your idea, um, product or a service. So how do we go about doing that? Well, prototyping is not about refining the picture of your first idea. It's about exploring alternatives. And again, ex-CEO Bezos, uh, I believe we're the best place in the world to fail. We have plenty of practice in failure and invention are inseparable twins. So they do thousands of tests every year at Amazon. Most of the products or services don't ever get published. They're not things that they put out <coughs> to the public. So you might wanna people mute there. Um, so don't worry about the idea of you know um, failure Failure is just a learning event. Okay, that didn't work. Great. Now we can check the box that that's invalidated. Let's move to the next, next section. There's always learning. When most of these companies do prototyping, this is what it looks like. Honestly, it's, you don't have to go to a 3D you know, printer or some um, manufacturer and get something injection molded and very fancy and nice and expensive. Prototyping is down and dirty. This is about trying to come up with a construct of your thoughts that could help the customer overcome their problems. And as you see down here on the right, this is the initial Google Glass, you know, um, the VR. They had cardboard, a little bit of styrofoam, and just some, you know, plastic as their their glass. That was it. They didn't build some high-end injection molded thing and go test it. That's a prototype. Usually it's done with these things, right? Construction paper, tin foil, you know, tape, all these things, because you're just trying to get the form to say to someone, is this, is this what you're talking about? Is this the thing that would fill your needs? It doesn't have to be pretty, right? Because usually the first iteration of MVP is not gonna look pretty anyways. So that's a product. What about a service? Well, a service, you use a storyboard. So a storyboard is a visual representation of a sequence and it breaks down the action into individual panels, right? So when we think about a book, you know, and chapters and just what happens, almost like a, uh, again, just a table of contents where you're, you're seeing a, um, you know, doing a flip chart, right? So what could that look like? Well, we could say, you know, we have an app. Many of you probably are doing something around an app and technology. I saw a commercial, it says download the app. Okay, great. That's the first thing. I, I'm hungry, I download the app. I place the order. What happens next? Well, I have to wait my 25 minutes until I um, go pick up the food. I drive to the restaurant. And this is about an e-coupon. They're talking about how do we use the coupon. And so I present the e-coupon, I take a survey, I pick up my food. So in this instance, this company wanted to do a e-coupon. What does that storyboard look like? What's a prototype look like for an e-coupon? Well, that's exactly what this is here, is your version of that experience of every step of what the customer has to do in their journey. They don't care about 
what you have to do to make the food, but they got to pick the food up, they got to drive there, right? They got to download the app. So all those things that they do step by step. And what this does is it really helps you understand maybe some pieces you forgot, right? You're just thinking about building the app. And you're like, great, the app works, we're awesome, good to go. Well, what about other things? You know, what about, uh, you know, the them driving or the uh, uh, showing you the app or placing the order just to make sure all these things work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our own uh, exercise and we're gonna use DoorDash again. And we're going to create our own storyboard which many of you, um, you know, we kind of already talked through before. So now we're just going to kind of list things out. What would each of those steps look like if we're, if we are DoorDash and we are making sure that our solution, we're prototyping out this journey, what does that look like? So Cameron, I'll throw it back to you. Yep. So we had one question. Um, it was for uh, someone who's on just kind of leading an idea um, concept um, by herself. Um, how would she um, go about brainstorming if she doesn't have a team? Um, first, I would uh, either get some friends or get some advisor council, right? Get some mentors. You want to have an advisory council anyways. Get people that you trust, that you think add value to you, that you can lean on. Um, what, what that looks like. So you're going to want to have that as a startup anyway. So hopefully you can surround yourself with three or four of those people or some friends at least that that might be interested to help you. Awesome, yep, great advice. Uh, Dick threw in there, find a mentor and I'll be sharing a resource at the end which is called Mentor Sacramento which you can um, plug into finding a mentor to, to brainstorm and, and uh, have a sounding board. Um, Yama had a great um, comment as well in terms of looking at um, prototypes. Uh, Dropbox created a video prototype um, which kind of encompassed the story and how it would be used. So what, a couple more questions, Brian, before we hop in. Um, Jay says, how is the importance level of MVP, MVP for early adopters not buggy and not, and not can break down? Um, maybe, Jay, do you wanna share what you're, you're asking? Sure, um, sorry for, uh, no I type it pretty quick. Okay. So I was wondering like how important is the, um, the quality of the MVP that you're giving uh, rather than the, um, the sooner delivery date for the customers. I think this is like a game between uh, faster delivery and the quality. So I was wondering which one is the more important one. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great question. And I, I guess I could say it depends on the thing you're delivering. If it's something that's life or death, then I, quality probably matters. But in general, think of it this way. Um, your early adopters expect there's gonna be some bugs and that you're gonna be changing things, right? They're sharing your passion for the problem and your vision for what can be in the future. They're, they know they're not just settling for the MVP, that you're gonna to continue to build features on it in the future. So that roadmap is really important to them you sharing, this is just the MVP, you know, here's version two, here's the roadmap version three. That roadmap is more important to most early adopters than the MVP itself. They're sharing your vision. So know that they, they expect there to be bugs, but they want to give you feedback on those bugs. Hey, I noticed this, can you change this? They are your champions. So you don't want it to be, you know, almost unusable, there's so many bugs but don't worry about one or two bugs because they're gonna give you feedback. You're, you should be continually asking them, hey, you know, is this working? What could be better? Because they're your champions. They're gonna help you refine it to get to the next levels, but keep sharing the roadmap because that's what's keeping them invested in you is the vision, not really your MVP. Great, thank you so much. And then um, the last question we had, and then we'll head into breakout groups is, um, is a focus group too random at this stage? So kind of knowing where our customer segment is, this too early for going about doing a focus group? Focus groups are okay, but you're not gonna get as much feedback as you would with one-on-one -on -one customer interviews or discussion. 
in one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to get much deeper, more insights, more, more honest feedback from people. Um, when you get into a focus setting, it's kind of group think. You know, someone says something and they're like, oh yeah, me too, and this, and you normally don't get the depth and the detail you want to get. It's okay um, as a tool, but it's definitely not um, one of the top tools you should use. It's definitely more of one-on-one -on -one customer interviews. Even, you know, forums, um, or blogs, you know, emails are probably better than just a focus group. Awesome. All righty. We'll head to, to breakouts. How long do you want, Brian? Oh, what do you think? Uh, 720. Yeah. Eight, eight, minutes. eight minutes, maybe probably won't take us too long. Okay. Perfect. Alrighty. You will see uh, breakout rooms open. If not, you're in my room. Cool. All righty. I will share my screen. Where is it? There it is. All righty, we're rocking and rolling here, group. All righty, so we're going to do a storyboard for the DoorDash experience in working with um, the, uh, the user side. So what does that, that look like in terms of the user experience if we're to start mapping that out? What's kind of the first component of um, the user's experience? They download the app. Perfect. W would they decide they're hungry? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's a great, which one, um, how, I guess, what's the triggering event for them to download the app? Is it them getting hungry? Are they seeing an app, uh, uh, an advertisement? Are they Sometimes getting a referral get from a friend? Like free delivery options like they like if you see like free delivery on your first order like that incentive sometimes that's how I downloaded it because it said that free delivery for me on my first order free on first cool so they uh, an ad ad for free delivery on first order um, then the user downloads the app What's the next part of when they're they're downloading it? So they downloaded it. Do they set up a profile? Do they just go in and start ordering food? Do, what do they have to do? Credit card information. So. Their address. So let's. Um, I'll do it like this. Set up profile, and then we'll have these little things. We got credit card address what else anything else uh delivery instruction all right all right is there anything else or is there a next step after that once they've set up their profile their food choice yeah, food choices. So they uh, look through Find food choices. Find a local restaurant. Sometimes they like also filter it to what is closest and what delivery fee, like what's the amount of delivery fee. But I don't know if like that's something that we want to put in there. Filter by food type location, um, price maybe. Time, I think you can see how long it would take to get it. Yep, perfect. All right, so they, they've now found a location. What's the next step? So like their meals? Yep. So they yeah, find, the, find, the the main, find the the uh, menu to figure out what they want to eat. Okay. Explore menu. Choose food.
Are we are we done? Is that is that all we have to do? Click buy. Click buy. Yeah. So what does that purchase process look like? Is it as simple as buy now? Yeah, it's it's very simple. It's just like when you do your food, just hit pay now, and it just. Boom. Is there like a a tipping mechanism? Is there? There is. There is uh, tipping. Tip driver. Um, okay. So the next next step. So they've ordered the food. What's the next part of that user's experience? Uh, you can when, when you Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Carrie. Well, you can choose when you want it, if you want it as a ASAP or later. So is that when they're purchasing the food? I don't remember if it's before you purchase or not. <laughs> it's somewhere in this, the line between choosing the food and purchasing the food. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, where do we think it is? Like if you were designing that experience and that's that's part of this whole, the reason we're doing this exercise, right? Is like, where is that falling, falling in this user experience? Cause that, if you didn't bring that up we would have uh, been assuming everyone wanted it delivered ASAP, right? So. I think we should put a block between purchase food and explore menu. And then we could just put order food because I think purchasing and tipping the driver would be kind of sort of one box. And then, so this is order food, okay food and timing yeah all right so they they've now purchased what's next in their experience get a confirmation confirmation is it an email is it a text is it a phone call is it um a tiktok video what are they sending them passenger pigeon i believe what was that kelly i was just joking with you i no. said it was a passenger pigeon gotcha that might come not as fast as the food. <laughs> so how do, how do they send the confirmation? I, I think the basis for confirmation is knowing the total price and then they confirm. Yeah, sometimes I get emails, but if I like want to opt out from them, I can, but I, I usually get emails. Okay, confirmation. I think there's an app notification, I think as well. Okay. All right, they get the foods confirmed. Now they're they're playing, um, you know, they're turning on their Netflix. Um, what's the next part of their um, user experience as they've now had their food confirmed? Just waiting on notifications or like a text from the driver if the food is here or if they're on the way. Okay, so is there a text? Do, do you any do you hear anything from the restaurant when the food is done? We usually get, get a notification from like door, on DoorDash that, hey, the food has, the driver is on the way. And then I think it's a, it's a hit or miss. Sometimes I get a text from the driver. Sometimes I don't get a text from the, from the driver about um, like how, how long it will be for them to deliver. Okay. I think there's one that has been picked up too sometimes. Um. So the, the driver has your food. <laughs> yep. Driver has your food. Okay. I don't location know. tracking. So we got, um, let's, yeah, Bryce, you said something, location tracking? Yeah, location tracking. So um, provided ability to view order driver. Maybe that's like a throughput down here somewhere. All right, we got um, a couple more steps. So they got notification, order a, a driver has your order, and now do they get anything? The driver's um, here, um, close by. Is it just randomly put on your, and you have to like keep an eye out on the front porch? You have to stand there and wait, high five them. I usually like it put in my delivery instructions that meet me by the basketball court. So I usually like take it because sometimes people just take it from the door. The so door how, how, I love that. How do you know to go from your, um, where you're living to the basketball court? Um, it's just outside my building. 
So I just I know, but I, how do you, how do you know when to go? Do you just oh, stand? Oh, they you? they they text me when they're okay. here, and right. so I just say two minutes, or sometimes when I'm like I usually, so because DoorDash has this tracking like the entire timeline from when the food is ordered to when you take it from the the driver. So I think usually just sometimes when it tells me two minutes until the driver is about to reach. So I just, you know, prepare myself in a way. Awesome. And when I go down there, I just call the number of the driver and then I like try to find them and then they, whatever, yeah. yeah. Just Perfect. All right, so you're texted when the food arrives and then you're, um, you grab your order and just enjoy. Enjoy. All right, so is that, does that complete our experience? There's ahead, usually a, a request for rating the order and the delivery, I think. Yeah. You got it. Right. Does that encompass our user's experience? Awesome. I know it seems somewhat of a simple process, but you could see where things get um, left out and, you know, where we make assumptions as we're building, you know, our prototype. So thinking of this as your first, you know, kind of iteration before you build, say, wireframes right before DoorDash started to actually like draw it out, right? If they spent all this time and they missed all these parts of the process, um, you know, the, the user's experience won't necessarily flow in an effective way. So um, it's just kind of a great way to, to get that first iteration out there. So I'm going to close their rooms. Are there any questions um, as we wait for them to come back? Or any thoughts of, you know, how you might use this or if you've ever used a storyboarding? Um, you know, one thought is, you know, as you make these storyboards, you can always turn them into videos and talk about what that user's experiences look like before you even, you know, ultimately design anything um, in terms of an actual physical product or service, so. If you have a fairly complicated idea, would you create storyboard lines for each kind of pathway you envision? Share more um, in terms of kind of what, you, as you're looking at the complexity, is that like a multi-phased process or how are you kind of seeing that? Um, well, it's a software that can do many things. So would you just kind of select the pathways and then try to storyboard those each separately. So, um, and you can tell me if this uh, recommendation is too broad, but I'm um, kind of just going back to the the roots of putting yourself in that uh, the user's um, shoes, right? And like, what are the key steps that they need to go through? Um, it might be very complex where there's yes and no decisions, and I think that's where partly the the uh, storyboarding might be difficult, but. I think going through those different use cases where user A says yes to all things, right? And, and developing what that might look like and then what no looks like. And then you kind of start to build those iterations. But I think just building a first kind of one, which is maybe your first use case with that core customer segment would be my recommendation. Um, I don't know, Brian, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to, to know. I understand what you're, what you're saying there, Carrie. So, um, the initial one could be more high level and, you know, basic steps, but uh, then you could have swim lanes, right? It's more of a workflow process you're talking about. If, if, if yes, then this, if no, then this. So you're pretty much talking workflow and swim lanes. And you would definitely want to map all that out, right? That could be a really detailed storyboard um, once you get into it, especially for you, the internal side, you know, if a customer says yes, then maybe you have to call the database and you've got to do this and you got to do this. Well, the customer doesn't care about that stuff, right? They're just like, you know, here's what I want to have happen. So you'll probably have an internal thing later on workflow. Um, but at this time, pretend you're the customer and just think about the big high level ones. And if that's a detailed chart, then, you know, so be it. As uh, long as they're pretty important steps in the customer's journey. So I'd look at, for instance, on a complex issue where it would be like a user needs to create, let's say, two to three data points. So that's the value added 
So would the lanes, because they're sequential, would they need to be on top of each other in that case, or would you suggest they be in, par in, uh, in, uh, in parallel or in series, excuse me? So if you did like an example, like we just did, and you know, user selects this, this thing, right? Um, then what happens? So that is- like, or, or like time, right? Like if I report this week, one thing, next week, the next thing, this third week, the next thing, you know, that's the value added, but it's three uses to generate one workflow. So it's kind of like they're compounded on top of each other over time. Yeah. Um, I would just say if it's from the customer's view and there are very different steps, then yeah, map, map those out, right? You might have a, a huge, your entire wall, you know, could be if it's really that complex, I guess, but um, think about it from their terms of what they what their journey is because the idea here is somewhere within that journey you want to make sure you're identifying the constraints and the problems that they might run into that you didn't think about otherwise and so those bottlenecks constraints pains of either using or doing something you want to make sure is is seamless and that you're getting rid of the weakest link makes sense thank you Good question. Okay. Hopefully that was a fun exercise and we are experts in DoorDash now. All right. So unfair advantage. Uh, this one is an interesting one because most of the time, startup entrepreneurs don't know what their unfair advantage is, and that's okay. So when we look at the lean canvas, you know, this box right here on upper right, you know, something that cannot easily be bought or copied. So when you think about what you have that's an unfair advantage, think about things like, oh, I'll, I'll give some examples in a minute, but that your experience or, you know, some um, technology that, you know, you're an expert at or some, you know, intellectual property, different things. So what is it that makes you really, really hard to copy? So if tomorrow I want to do what you're doing, what would be my barriers to entry? What are those things that you have that would make it difficult for me to follow? So we, we just talked about can't be easy to buy or cut. You might not know it now. And this is the key thing to bring up here is as you're starting your journey, just recognize that you want to be cognizant of what are those things that you either realize after time that, oh, you know, this is, I have this skill that not many people do, or I have this thing so that you can document that to show investors or other stakeholders. And that's pretty key, right? If you have a low barrier to entry and anyone can copy you, well, then it's all about speed and marketing and you know getting there first. But if you have something that is really unique, that is something that investors are gonna wanna see, right? That's a very big feather in your cap as a team that you have something unique. And maybe it's, you know, you're, you're all great at this certain type of, of coding and you've got 30 years experience at it. So just think about that over time as you go forward to document it so that you can portray that to investors. So some examples, a patent, maybe you have a sole source supply chain, right? Raw materials now are tough. You know, think about PPE material or mass. You know, if you had something locked up, that's a huge unfair advantage. An exclusive contract, let's say you had something with the state of California and you've got it, you know, locked up for a couple of years. That's a massive <laughs> unfair advantage. SEO ranking. So you can do a Google ad and pay for it, but SEO ranking is organic. You cannot just say tomorrow, I want my SEO ranking to be in the front page. It won't happen. It takes time. So that time and your ranking is a huge unfair advantage. Insider information, you know, hopefully it's not uh, illegal, but if you have insights to technology, 
or things that are happening uh, in a company, great. Be able to use that, maybe connections, relationships. Thought leadership, you know, if you've got 30 years experience in a certain industry and that's where you're creating a new solution for, that's a big deal. A large network, if you've got, you know, 100,000 followers on Facebook and, you know, a million on Instagram, that is not easy to copy. So I can't go out and copy that tomorrow and reach a million people on Instagram like you have. So list that. Expert endorsements, if you have a, you know, a, a influencer, social media, or you've got a you know, pro, pro athlete or somebody famous endorsing your product, that's not easy to copy. So simple homework, think about what your unfair advantage is, document it, and just keep it in the back of your mind. So wrapping up, we left some good time for questions. I'll turn it over to you, Cameron, if we have any burning ones, and then we'll open it up for you guys to ask some questions, and then we'll talk about what's next. It doesn't look like there's any burning questions in the chat. I did want to uh, just note something that I put in the chat earlier. We will be providing um, all the presentation material in a PDF format. We'll also be sending a recording of this um, session. We also have created a SharePoint that has all of the tools um, that we've discussed today. So the value proposition canvas, um, things for storyboarding all in a SharePoint. And then I have also created a worksheet that has um, ways to document all of those homework activities. You're more than welcome to uh, share both week one and two with myself or Brian, and we're happy to have kind of office hours to go through that. So feel free to, to send that quote unquote homework um, back to us, but it's really you know kind of up to you and wanting to push those forward. Um, so hopefully I bought some, some time for people to uh, ask some questions um, about the content here today. So we got one from Albie. Do you want to share it or would you like me to read it? Happy You're to from share Queensland, it. Um, so, okay. Yeah, from Australia. Yeah, g'day. Um, it's about lunchtime today. So um, thanks very much for letting me in. I didn't know whether this was just a Sacramento thing. So um, I lived I'm, in Brizzy, so don't, don't worry about it. Oh, cool. No worries. I'm um, all from Brisbane, so good. Okay. I'm only about six hours drive north of there uh, on the Great Barrier Reef almost. Um, so my question just with, uh, so when you have something that's patentable um, potentially uh, and you want to do an MVP, um, there's rules here in Australia with patent law that if you divulge anything ahead of your patent, then you can't actually apply for your patent. So how do you creatively do slices of your MVP to test that? without giving away too much if, you know, all going and patenting 10 different things to hope that one of them is it. Yeah. That's an interesting question. That's definitely a very specific legal question that I'm probably not well versed to answer. Um, How would you handle it? How would you do it? If you knew you had something that was going to be patentable, which is your key point of difference that uh, VCs, angel investors would be interested in, how could you test that? So or would you just do a fake door, like something that doesn't look like it or give away too much? So it's a great question. I mean, um, the, the first thing is I would probably be trying to document and patent as much as I could, right? Because you want several utility patents if you can get them, you want wraparound patents and you know, you want as many things as possible so that you are pretty protected from other people just barely changing what you're doing, right? That doesn't mean you actually have to build all of them. That doesn't mean they all have to go to market, right? You've got all these things out there on paper. Great, maybe that's you know an easy way for you to protect yourself, especially in that legal environment. Um, but when you're getting insights, remember that we're getting insights to a problem and we're trying to figure out, okay, this problem exists because these alternatives don't meet the need. And then you're talking about if I could solve your problems in this ways, would that you know, be of help? It sounds like you might say even alluding to that is giving away potentially something. If so, then I would probably say, okay, let's just document everything and then we'll go back potentially and figure out what actually is a solution that's viable to create as an MVP. 
So um, I just don't know how costly patents you know, are and how long that would take you to write those up. So I guess it would be a little more due diligence to figure out, is it worth my time to create all those patents or to you know, just make sure I'm focusing on one? And that's a tough question. I'm not sure I'm able Can to- Can I throw in a comment? Yeah. Sure. Um, you can file provisional patents on all your different ideas and then they're on record you have them secured but you don't spend the money until you've figured out which one of those is the one you're wanting to go with so that's what i would recommend that was the and, term uh, looking for. thank you provisional well done thank you yeah and just one thing to keep in mind with provisional patents is uh, you have only a year uh before actually you know filing the real patent so there is a time constraint on that. Absolutely, but it gives you a, it gives you a window to work with. Yes. Great comment. Does that help? Uh, yeah. So I, I knew about the provisionals. So it was more a case of rather than putting out twenty provisional patents, and and I guess that's the, I get I guess that's your risk that you have to put forward to then you know learn out which one which ones will work, which ones won't, and um, yeah, it was I guess it was just trying to be a bit more risk adverse. How do you do that? How do you narrow that down and test that? But um, yeah, pr provisional patents, I guess, are the way to go. And one, one thought I was thinking was just in line if, if each patent's kind of associated to a specific problem that you're trying to solve and, and prioritizing those in terms of the one that's the highest need problem or job to be done for your potential customer base. I don't know the intricacies of what you're building, but if it's, you know, this actually solves the greatest problem for your customer base, then, you know, that would might be the first one that you go with. And then you kind of can see as more features come online that you start to file those patents. Um, Cause if you're trying to build something with all the specs and all the features, that's probably where you're having all those um, patents come in, in, into play. So, um, but great, great question. I, you know, I would recommend any of that be with uh, someone who's <laughs> legal for sure. Um, you know, we can only kind of provide from a, from a business perspective, but I think there's been some good insight and um, appreciate the conversation because I think other people, you know, are learning from that thought as well. Very interesting question. Thanks. Guys. All right. So the next question was from Jay. Uh, when is a good time to file for trademarking? Um, another one on this side. I don't know if Brian, you've had any experience in that space? Very limited. So yeah, honestly, the those sort of legal questions, I would definitely not want to give too much guidance on because I, I don't know enough to be dangerous. If anyone else does on here, trademark, you know, copy. Trademarks are cheap. Go ahead and file them now. I mean, you're in three or 400 bucks. And they take you know, so little it's, time. It's the time weight, uh, the lag that you have to secure it. So uh, relatively speaking, trademarks are pretty cheap. Just grab them. And not just the time wait, it's also the time to do it. The time invested in, in writing of a patent, if you're doing it yourself, is just astronomical. Uh, if you're paying somebody to do it, the cost could be astronomical. It um, is. Obviously, in, in doing a, a trademark, it's, it's a much quicker process. And early on in the growth uh, trajectory, you've got a lot of other things on your hands. Um, Cameron, if you don't mind if I can I jump in on kind of on the patent talk. Uh, this is Thomas Hall from Clean Start. Um, something that comes up, have, comes up around this is if you file a provisional patent and then say I have a patent or a provisional patent, they can go and look at that and say, you know what, like, yeah, that works, but I can design something right next to it that isn't infringed upon your patent. So if you're making a patent, you either should expect to spend a lot of money to defend it if someone does that, or maybe try to keep it a trade secret and try to keep that as your secret sauce that you don't show anyone and just show them the beginning and the end. Because if it's if it's a hardware thing that you know they look at and okay, I can just do one off, you know, they can just copy your patent to some extent. I mean, not exactly, but um, there's a lot of ways to engineer something to engineer the solution just slightly different. So really think about that when you're going to get, do a, uh, spend a lot of money on a patent or a provisional patent. Um, there's the time frames, and then there's the the fact that you're going to be giving everyone your secret sauce, um, and you don't know if it works yet, and you know it, it might not be worth it. So just good, 
Good, good feedback, Thanks for Thank you, Thomas. In. Yep, good feedback. And so I'll make a um, recommendation. We have a, and I'll share in a second, um, a resource called Mentor Sacramento in the in the region. Um, it's a great way to hop in and you know get some of those quick questions answered from you know experts in in those particular issue areas um, as it pertains to kind of small business and some of those you know trademark or legal questions. But um, that would be the best bet I would think to get a proper answer um, moving forward. But love the conversation. Is there any questions related to? you know, the topics that we discussed here today in terms of the, the value proposition, solution, unfair advantage, um, and even some of the stuff last week in particular, you know, the lean canvas and kind of design thinking. And if you have broader questions, you know, we're happy to have that conversation as well, but um, just wanted to kind of align some of our time towards that. Well, I'll ask then what were the key insights you took away from tonight or something that you're still completely confused about and worse than you were when you got here? Just, I mean, for me, the importance of actually going through the exercise. I mean, uh, otherwise you're, you're really shooting in the dark. Um, You'll prioritize things that don't need to be prioritized. You're, I mean, you just, ultimately, you're just gonna waste a lot of time. Having done it in the past, I know. Thank so you. yeah, it was great, great, uh, great exercise. Enjoyed, enjoyed doing it. Good, thank you. Um, I, I, I just have one question. If, um, just in the context of the uh, lean canvas that we did last week, um, how, how do these exercises that we did uh, fall within the Lean Canvas framework? Because I, I actually need to go back and look at the Lean Canvas to try to remember uh, yeah. all the elements. But do we still do the Lean Canvas in its entirety first before we move on to the, these other ones we did? Yeah, today? absolutely. So think about the Lean Canvas as your business model, right? It's what you think of it as now. Put everything on there. Do that now. Get it out of your head, put it on the lean canvas. That's your business model, that's your plan. Now we have to test the, the leaner canvas, the problem in the customer segment. Because right now it's your opinion and we all know what opinions are like, we all have one. So that's your opinion, we gotta go test it. And to test that, to make sure you you have a customer that actually has this problem and then your, your solution can actually solve that problem, we gotta do the insights. And the tools like tonight will help us gather those insights, the value prop canvas, kind of that design thinking and lean start mentality. Those are just mindsets and tools we use with the lean canvas to help us figure out that problem, the solution, gather the insights, the customer forces canvas is part of the lean canvas journey. So okay. there's tools that we're using there to help us on the assessment. We're now, we've, we've done the data dump from our head. Now we gotta go validate. How do we validate that? We've got to use some other tools to help us document the insights. Yeah. Okay, so, and if you, you, yeah, great, great uh, question, Christopher. And and part of if you look at the um, the value proposition canvas, it's actually a zooming out of um, the the main middle one, which is the value proposition, and then the customer segment. So that's how you're identifying. Or actually, maybe it's a zoom into who who exactly those people are in terms of. Um, those skill sets. So it all builds on each other and provides additional insights into your larger business model. So that's a great question of how they all tie in together. Um, and so as we go through the five weeks, you'll see each of the uh, sections that we talk about is one of the nine elements of the lean canvas. So we're working our way through all those aspects. So you should have a refined business model by the end of the five weeks. And thank you, Cameron. Great. And what we're adding in are other tools to help that journey because, and if you look at Lean Stack, which um, we use the Lean Canvas from, they actually promote other theories too. You know, continuous innovation is what they talk about and it's using design thinking or blue ocean strategy, which we'll talk about next week um, or the value prop canvas and all these things, right? So they understand that they're providing a framework and the Lean Canvas is a tool to document it and a framework of how to go about it. But there's other great tools we can use in that journey to, to help us get there. Did 
Okay. Awesome. Well, hopefully you can like us on LinkedIn and, you know, the, it will send a kind of a recap of some pictures. We appreciate any comments and good feedback and hopefully you'll join us next week. Tell some friends, love to continue to, to grow it. Um, so Cameron, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'm just going to make some, some last announcements. Um, I threw a bunch of links into the chat. So I just kind of want to describe what those are. Those are additional resources. The top one is a um, online platform called Mentor Sacramento. You can go on there and set up a profile and connect with mentors. Um, it is, you know, targeted for the Sacramento region, but there is a global network that's underlying the platform called Micro Mentor. So you can go in there, uh, follow that link and just set up a profile. Um, you can use Carlson Center as your kind of link to it and, and connect with mentors. I think we have a couple on here today who are um, on the mentor side. Um, I'll have Thomas uh, talk after me. He's running a, a clean start toolkit on February 11th, and you can learn more about how to build a clean start um, or clean technology company. Um, we're also running in March at the start of March, a social innovation series. So if you're looking to start a, a social venture, we're running a four part series um, with the, our partners at the College of Continuing Education. So we have um, two of our partners here today on that. So we're excited. You can attend an info, information session next Friday, or you can register for the four part series through that second link there. Um, we also are running on February 18th, a workshop uh, called Grants for Startups, the definitive freelance and startup guide to um, grant funding. And that's with a, a local startup called Open Grants. Um, and you can access uh, grants for startups in that space. We also following that on the same day, which is February 18th, we have an Ask Me Anything with the entrepreneur made at Sac State, Rashawn Davis, um, who's the um, co-founder and CEO of um, Unseen Heroes. And then the last three things are just kind of standing resources. We have a weekly newsletter of all startup happenings um, and you can subscribe there. And then Brian, myself and Jesse, our other entrepreneur and residents has office hours. So feel free to plug into any and all of those resources. We'd love for you to, to do so. Um, and then Thomas, did you want to say just a quick word about the toolkit you're running? Um, so the Clean Start Toolkit is just kind of a um an add-on to uh, this. And what we're gonna talk about is additional resources that are there for clean tech companies. Uh, the CEC, the Air Resources Board, our local air district, and now hopefully in the coming year, support from the federal government is gonna be opening up grants and other financial support to help you grow your company. We'll also have Gary Simon, our founder, who's been the head of um, several Fortune 500 companies in the clean tech area. Um, so come and ask him questions. And make sure you go to that open grants uh, thing that Cameron Law mentioned because a lot of the grant funding, you know, it takes a little, it's, it takes a little bit of skill to figure out how you're going to go out there and get those. So um, look forward and hopefully see everyone there. There's a link in the chat and thank you. I'll make a last quick comment. So Cameron mentioned office hours. For those of you, obviously these are free sessions. You know, you can, you know, you're getting some high level stuff. You can call us for a, an office hour and you know, uh, half an hour, ask some questions, brainstorm, whatever it might be. But then the next step, usually folks are like, okay, well, I need some more guidance. I want some coaching, consulting, you know, weekly, bi-weekly. And I do that as my business, my consulting business. And so uh, after you talk to us on the office hours, do these things, we'd love to, if there's anyone who needs more additional help, then let us know. And we can talk about how to, how to best coach and help you through this uh, as a consultant. Awesome. All righty. We'll be following up with all of those resources. We'll get you out here right at eight. Um, so appreciate all of you hopping on tonight and look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. So we'll see you then and have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.